This is a pre-lab lecture video for experiment 14 on electrochemistry. And in this lab we have two goals. The first is to create a reduction potential table using five unknown metals. The second goal is to use the Nernst equation to determine the ionic concentration of an unknown silver solution. Now if you need any other background information other than what's given in this pre-lab lecture video, please see the other recorded lectures on electrochemistry associated with your lecture. So if our first goal is to create a reduction potential table, we need to understand what a reduction potential table is. And in this reduction potential table, all of the reactions are written as reductions. And these reductions, these values have to be relative to something else. So because they have to be relative to something else, we have to define what that is. And that's generally the standard reduction potential of protons making hydrogen gas. So this reaction right here is the reaction that everything else is compared to. And we define this one as zero. So the silver reduction is 0.8 higher in volts than the reduction potential of the protons. And the cobalt reduction potential is 0.28 below that for the reduction of the protons to hydrogen gas. These are all relative to each other. And this is very similar to how we define altitude. So if we want to figure out how high something is, we have to have it relative to something. We have that as being sea level. And things can be below sea level, just like we can have negative reduction potentials, so things that are less than that of the reduction potential of the protons. Now, a couple of other things to notice about the reduction potential. So first of all, that these reactions are all reductions, but notice that they're listed in decreasing order. So the fluorine is the most positive reduction potential, and then, then the gold, then the silver, then the copper, and then the hydrogen, which is zero, and then they become negative, such as a 10, and then you get larger negative numbers, so the reduction potentials get smaller. So keep this in mind when you build your own reduction potential based on the unknowns that you do in lab. So the first one will be the one with the highest reduction potential, and your last one will be the one with the lowest or the most negative reduction potential. Now fluorine gas, this is the strongest oxidizing agent. So this means that it's a good oxidizing agent so it can take electrons from other things. This is because fluorine is very easy to reduce. So because it's very easy to reduce, it has the largest reduction potential. So this makes fluorine a good oxidizing agent because it itself wants to be reduced. Well, this makes the zinc 2 plus a very weak oxidizing agent. So if the zinc 2 plus is the weakest oxidizing agent, this makes the zinc metal the strongest reducing agent. So it doesn't want to go in the forward direction, it would rather go in the reverse direction. So notice if we wrote this as an oxidation potential, the oxidation potential for zinc metal is positive 0.76. So the more positive the oxidation potential, the more favorable the reaction. So in this case, the zinc is the strongest reducing agent because it wants to give up two electrons. Well, if zinc metal is the strongest reducing agent, this makes the F minus the weakest reducing agent because it's not going to be very likely for the fluorine to give up its electron. Remember, fluorides are very electronegative. So let's say we're going to look at the reduction potential of a cell that contains both zinc and copper. So when I look at this, because the copper is higher on the table and this reduction potential is more positive, this is the reaction what's going to be for the copper. So the copper is going to be reduced because it has a more positive reduction potential. So if the copper is going to be reduced, the copper is going to be reduced, this must mean that the zinc is going to be oxidized. So we have to write this reaction in the reverse so that the zinc solid goes to zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons. 
And so when we write it as the oxidation, remember that the sign of the potential changes. So now the oxidation potential, so the oxidation potential is 0 0.76. So I'm just kind of showing this information here below. We took the zinc reduction potential and we flipped it so that we have the oxidation potential as 0.76 when the copper is being reduced and that reduction potential is 0.34. And the combination when you add the reduction and the oxidation half reactions you get the cell potential. So the cell potential at standard conditions for zinc and copper is 1.10 volts if we add the oxidation and the reduction half reactions together to get our overall reaction. And notice that this is a positive value, so this indicates that this will be a spontaneous reaction. So if copper was reduced, this means that copper was at the cathode. And if the zinc was oxidized, this means that zinc was at the anode. So when this was hooked up to a potential, a voltmeter, to, re to register the volts if we were to measure this, then the cathode the cathode is positive, this would be attached to the red wire on the voltmeter and the anode which is negative would be attached to the to the black end to the black wire on the voltmeter. So some useful information to help you remember some of these things. So at the anode, the anode is negative and this is attached to the black lead or the black wire on the voltmeter and at the anode oxidation occurs and oxidation is that the oxidation number gets larger and the oxidation is a loss of electrons. Now the counterparts to all that is the cathode. The cathode is positive. It's attached to the red lead and the reduction happens at the cathode and this is the oxidation number gets smaller so the oxidation number gets reduced. This is why we call it a reduction. So the reduction is a gain of electrons. So here are some memorization tools to help you remember some of these things. First of all, there's oil rig where the oxidation is the loss of electrons and the reduction is the gain of electrons. Another one is if you're trying to remember what happens at the anode and which happens at the cathode, anode and oxidation both begin with vowels and cathode and reduction both begin with consonants. And the charge, the anode is negative like anions are, cathodes are positive like cations are. Another thing to help you remember is that the cathode is positive. It has a positive sign in the name. That T looks like a positive sign. And if you're having trouble remembering which color it goes to which electrode, the red, I think of red as being positive, so the red is a good thing, so uh, the red goes to the positive side, which is the cathode, and the black is dark and gloomy, so this is something that's negative, and the negative is the anode. So that may help you remember which is which. So in part one, you are going to be creating a reduction potential table. You will rank five unknown metals in order of their reduction potential. Now you will not be able to identify your unknowns because we're not using standard conditions which is 25 degrees C and one molar. Now another thing, we are assuming that all of the unknown metal ions are undergoing a two electron process. This may not be the case but this is the assumption that we're going to make for this lab. When you identify the strongest and the weakest oxidizing or reducing agents, you must list them in their appropriate states. So was it the ion form? or was it the solid form. Also again we're going to assume that each unknown metal ion has a 2 plus oxidation state and is reduced by two electrons. So you will set up your cells in the following manner. So we're going to be able to use a well plate so this uses a very small amount of solutions but they're very close together so you have to be careful not to accidentally spill your solutions into the other cells right beside it but on this side you will have your known solutions so these will be copper solutions so they'll be light blue in color so you'll have copper solutions in each one then you will have your salt bridges which is basically a strip of 
filter paper that has been wetted with potassium nitrate and this is going to again remember be our salt bridge so they're connecting the two cells and on the other side we will have the unknown solutions and the solutions on there have to match with the metal that you're going to be used and the yellow just simply corresponds to there um, when you put the unknown metal in there that has a yellow paint chip on it you need to use the yellow solution so the color of the solution itself isn't yellow but the identity on it the label on it says it's the yellow unknown so when you set this up and you've got remember you'll have to use the yellow unknown metal strip with a yellow solution you'll have to use the metal strip with a green dot on it with the unknown solution that's labeled green and so forth for all the rest of the solutions so in there you will attach the copper known metal piece here the unknown metal for the yellow in the other cell and then you will connect these two metals to your to your voltmeter and then you will move down the line and measure the voltage potential between each of the different cells and you'll have to make sure that when you measure them that you are getting a positive value because these are spontaneous reactions we are looking at galvanic cells so those are should have positive values so you need to hook them up so that you have a positive value on your voltmeter and this is important because this will tell you which solution is at the anode and which solution is at the cathode so this is a picture of the voltmeters that we will be using in class and you will need to attach the leads as shown to the right where the black lead is in the center and the red is on the right and you will dial in the meter so that it points to the 2 DC V on the meter so this will give our readings in volts again you need to attach the leads to the metal strips so that the cell potential is positive this will allow you to determine what metal is at the cathode and which is at the anode and many students forget to record this information and then they have to repeat all of the experiments so be careful and remember to record if the anode was at the yellow or if it was at the the copper solution and you'll have to do this for each cell because it will flip between some of these and again the cell potential is going to be the sum of the reduction half reaction and the oxidation half reaction so I'm just going to show you some representative data how this will work so you've set this up and you put your copper metal solution in your well plate and you've also put your copper metal strip and in the other side of that well you've attached the metal strip that has a yellow dot on it so you've connected this so that when you attach it to your voltmeter you get a positive value and the voltage uh, on that will say let's say uh, 0.710 volts well to get this positive reading you recorded that the copper was at the cathode so the cathode remember is where reduction takes place because they both start with consonants so if this is where the reduction took place and this is the cathode and remember the cathode is positive so positive something good so the red lead was attached to the copper side so if the copper was at the cathode this must mean that the unknown A was at the anode and the anode is the oxidation so this is the loss of the electrons and the anode is negative so that corresponds to the black so the yellow solution was attached to the black lead of the voltmeter so notice that I've written the half reaction for the unknown A and we said that we're assuming it's a two electron loss and when I sum these half reactions together I get my overall reaction as shown here now remember the oxidation potentials and the reduction potentials add up to give me my cell potential well 
if I know that my copper is my known, I can look up on the table and find that the reduction potential of copper is 0.34 volts. So if the oxidation potential plus reduction potential equals the cell potential, I can take the cell potential minus the 0.34 to get the oxidation potential of a known A. Now the last piece of information that I need to fill in the chart is the reduction potential for my unknown. But the reduction potential for my unknown, here I have it written as the oxidation, but I want the reduction potential. So to get the reduction potential, I simply multiply it by negative one. So the reduction potential for my unknown is negative 0 0.370. So you'll go through this process as you start to fill in your table for all of your unknown metals. But remember, you'll have to be careful because sometimes the cathode and the anode switch. So sometimes your copper is going to be at your anode and sometimes your copper is going to be at your cathode. Now in part two, we will be using the Nernst equation to determine the ionic concentration of an unknown silver solution. So here we're looking at a copper and silver. And so the copper is going to be oxidized and the silver is getting reduced. So we will use a known concentration of the copper to figure out the concentration of the silver solution. But to do that, we also have to create a calibration curve where we take several known concentrations of silver and known concentrations of copper to create a calibration curve. And then from that calibration curve, which gives us an equation of a line, we can calculate the concentration of the silver. So here's how we're going to do that. First of all, we're going to start off with the Nernst equation. And remember, the Nernst equation allows us to determine the cell potential at non-standard conditions. So we take the cell potential at standard conditions and subtract some value of it that adjusts the cell potential so that we get it at the non-standard conditions. And for this reaction, remember, we're looking at the copper and the silver. So it's products over reactants, so the copper is our product and our other reactant is the silver and remember because the silver is in the solid form we don't have to worry about it in our product quotient reaction and the copper is a solid so we can't express it as a concentration so it also doesn't show up in our Q value. So this is the products over the reactants we have to make sure we put that coefficient as our squared. This is going to be a common mistake for people to make is to forget about that square. Now using the information specific to our system, we will be using a copper 2 plus concentration of one molar. So this is what we'll use experimentally. And for this reaction, there's a two electron transfer. So we're going to put in the n value as being two because two electrons were being transferred. Now with our rule of logs, if I take the log of this number raised to the second power, I can pull that two out into the front. And when I do that, those twos cancel out. And I've pulled out a negative one from here, so I flip the silver from the denominator to the numerator. So this converts this from a negative to a positive value. And to make this a little bit easier to work with, Rather than using the log of the silver, we're going to use the PAG. And remember, the PAG is simply the negative log of the silver concentration, because every time you see P, it just means to take the negative log. So if we're going to take the P of the AG, which is the silver, we're taking the negative log of the silver concentration. So this converts the equation into this form. So I've just simply put the cell potential at standard conditions on the right-hand side and moved the negative 0 0.0592 PAG to the left-hand side. So this should look like the equation of a line where the cell potential at non-standard conditions is the Y value and the negative 0 0.0592 is the slope and the PAG is our X and our cell potential at standard conditions is our Y-intercept. So to collect our data necessary for the part two, the cells look very similar to our unknowns for part one. But here we have, we have five different 
silver solutions of different concentrations where we know their concentrations. And again, remember we have copper in each one of the other cells and this is at a one molar concentration. And then the last cell here, this is our unknown and we will be measuring the potential of this unknown so that we can find the concentration of it using the data for these other cells. And remember, these are the ones that we'll plot and from the graph that we plot, we can calculate the unknown concentration. So using the Nernst equation, which we derived on the previous slide, you are going to be able to plot the cell potential versus the PAG. So remember the PAG is just the negative log of the silver concentration, and that's going to be on the x-axis for those known concentrations of silver. And on the y-axis, you will have the cell potential that you measured for those known solutions. And from the trend line, you will be able to calculate the PAG for your unknown because you will measure the cell potential for that unknown. And from that cell potential, you can determine whatever the concentration of that unknown is. Now, if your data is good, the slope should be 0.0592. So remember, if we're using this equation here, if the data is good, the slope should be negative 0.0592 and the y-intercept should be 0.406 volts. So this is from the combination of the copper half reaction and the silver half reaction because the copper reduction potential is 340 millivolts and the silver reduction potential is 800 millivolts. So if the copper is being oxidized and the silver is being reduced, the copper oxidation potential is negative 340. So negative 340 plus 800 will give you 460 millivolts, so the cell potential should be 0.46 volts. Now here's some information specific to the lab. First of all, there's an Excel file on Blackboard for you to use. Turn this in instead of the tables in your lab manual. And there are three pages to this that you will turn in. There's the data collection page, there's the tables for part one, and the graph and tables for part two. Be sure to use these slope and intercept functions and not the numbers from the graph trend line because this introduces rounding errors that we want to avoid. And some additional reminders, rinse the alligator clips with water and store dry. This helps to prevent corrosion. Take the black box of metal strips, use the metal strips you need, return them to the box, then return the box. Do not throw the metal strips in the bottom of the tray or keep them. If the metal strips are a bit corroded or if they're oxidized, you may need to sand them down to help remove some of the oxide layer because the oxide layer will prevent the transfer of electrons so it won't conduct through the oxide layer. So you may have to make it shiny by scrubbing it up a little bit. But be sure not to scrape off the paint because then we won't know which metal that metal strip is. Also too, when you attach the alligator clips to your metal strips. Do not attach the alligator clips to the paint. The paint does not conduct electricity and you will not get a good reading. So make sure your alligator clips are attached to the shiny part of the metal. Wipe down your area to avoid unnecessary exposure to chemicals such as silver nitrate. Remember that the silver will stain your skin and also silver solutions that dry up and leave silver solids, they can become potentially explosive. And put your used gloves in the trash. Now if you're having trouble getting some data, there are some common things that you can do to improve your data. First of all, is the metal shiny? Metal coatings such as metal oxides on the metal surface prevent good cell measurements. So you may need to polish or sand the clips or the metal strips. Also, is the alligator clip attached to the shiny part of the metal? Don't clip it to the paint. The paint doesn't conduct. Another thing that may happen if you don't get a good value is you may not have put in the salt bridge. So is there a salt bridge? This is the filter paper that has been wetted with potassium nitrate. And for part one, a common mistake people use are using the wrong metals with the wrong metal solutions. So for part one, have you used the correct unknown solution with the correct unknown metal? For example, the yellow unknown solution goes with the metal strip with a yellow paint dot.
So this concludes our pre-lab lecture video for experiment 14 on electrochemistry. If you have any additional questions, be sure to ask your instructor when you get to lab. And be sure to listen in case your instructor has any additional information related to the lab or to safety.